Welcome to the Happy Dog, Happy Human podcast, where we explore the intersection between human mental health and our relationships with dogs. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, I'm Sharon. I am a human dog bond facilitator and therapeutic interaction strategist. I am the founder of Human Canine Collaborative, through which I support humans and dogs through trauma recovery, grief journeying, and professional practices of trauma-informed care by cultivating skills for somatic consent and nervous system regulation. I am also a licensed occupational therapist in California and hold a doctorate in occupational therapy with advanced clinical practice in community-based mental health. I have over 15 years experience working as a certified professional dog trainer and canine behavior consultant, specializing in public safety and dog bite prevention, animal assisted activities with special populations, and rehabilitation for anxious, reactive, and traumatized dogs. Hi, I'm Angela, the CEO of Cloud Doodles. We are a company that raises awareness about the benefits of dogs on mental health. We sell meaningful dog and human accessories to support our platform and to be able to give 25% of our profits to animal, dog, and mental health related charities. All of our patterns have a special mental health meaning and are designed and hand drawn by me. I believe that every human and dog should be privy to the unconditional love they provide for each other. I hold a BA in studio arts and a master's of social work. I am a licensed clinical social worker in the state of California, where I specialized in homelessness and severe mental illness. I currently reside in Italy with my poodle mix duchess, my husband, and toddler. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year, and welcome back to the Happy Dog, Happy Human podcast. This is Sharon. And this is Angela. And we're How so- is everyone doing? I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Good. I'm glad we got that out of the way. We got that out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad too. Yeah. So Angela, do you have any New Year's updates for Cloud Doodles? Well, at this very moment, we are doing a brand ambassador search that ends at the end of January. So if you have a dog account on Instagram, um, please check out our application. It's pinned on our grid. And it says brand ambassador search on it. Um, That's one thing. The second thing we're doing is spreading love and joy. Uh, It's a good, like a good uh, segue from our conversation um, throughout this month as uh, inspired by Valentine's Day. And the way we're doing that is we have some Valentine's bundles um, on our website. And we're also doing a, uh, an affirmation uh, cloud doodles love challenge on Instagram as well. So if you're on there, um, stay tuned and we would love to see you join our challenge. Nice. That sounds really fun. I can't wait to check it out. What about you, Sharon? Well, just before the holidays, I designed a grief guidance service, um, to support people who are experiencing grief in relation to a, the loss of a dog, whether it's um, because the dog has died or was rehomed, um, whether the dog was euthanized after a terminal illness or a behavioral euthanasia, um, or when, or if you're grieving the loss of your foster who found their forever home, um, or if your service dog has re- been retired, um, whatever um, is stimulating your grief, I'm providing a service to help people to feel seen and heard and normal in their grief, um, to build ritual and ceremony. So that would be like identifying ways of um, remembering your dog through a daily activity or tend uh, like building a routine to tend to your grief. Um, And then also helping you to overcome obstacles to engaging in things that you need to do to care for yourself or your family or to um, to find um, leisure activities again or new social activities or to rebuild um, an activity that you can do um, in inspiration of your dog that you lost. That sounds really great. And, uh, also just want to add that if, um, 
that Sharon provides free affinity calls to see if you guys are a good match. So don't hesitate to reach out to her, um, even just to have a, a preliminary conversation to see if it if it works out. Yeah, I love when people are curious, you know, and um, so I'm open to your curiosity and I want you to feel really comfortable with um, working with me. So yeah, go to hc-collab.com and you can read more about that service and schedule a time to meet up. So today we have a very special conversation about grief and we're going to focus on the human experience of grief today. And talking about grief can often move your body into feeling grief and that can be really uncomfortable and challenging. So I thought for our pre-care tip today, I would help us to set up a care plan for how we're going to care for ourselves during the conversation and after the conversation. Love it. Cool. So the first thing in our care plan is to determine how long we're going to talk for. So Angela, what like feels comfortable for you for a length of time? Oh, that's a really good, that's a really good thought. Um, I'm going to do a range. What about about 45 to 50 minutes, 55 minutes, somewhere between there? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds great. And what if along the way we feel like taking a break? Do you want to like have a certain time that we pause at or, or a certain protocol for how we initiate a break? Um, I think maybe we can say something like, why don't we pause here and take a breath? Um, and we can practice just a, a breathing exercise to, um, regulate ourselves. How does that sound? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So we'll just say, I need a break. Either one of us can do that. And I like that you identified something to do during the break to help us recenter. Sounds good. And I think maybe another good thing we could practice here since we've done, now we're experienced care tippers, <laughs> our audiences. Um, maybe we can also practice doing a shake it out. Um, mm. since this is, you know, in my experience of talking about grief, I definitely can feel a little wiggly in my body. And I think a shake it out can help, um, bring that out. Yes. Excellent. I love that. And we had done the shakeout in our very first episode. So it's great to keep practicing things that we've done before. Exactly. Cool. So the next part of our plan is to pause and we'll open the door for muggins. The muggins. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Okay, now the next part of our plan is to make sure we have something to drink because when emotions are coming up in the body, we wanna help them move through the system and drinking fluids can help with that. Great, I've got my tea actually. Nice, so, thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Awesome. And then I also like to have something to play with um, with my hands. It really helps like when I'm feeling uncomfortable and fidgety, if I have um, like a hairband, I might stretch and pull on that. Or sometimes I will use um, some putty, something that I can squish and squeeze. Oh, I know exactly the thing. I have my daughter's Play-Doh behind me. So let me go get that. Yes, perfect. Oops. <laughs> everyone saw my sweatpants yes lovely and cozy I really recommend dressing cozy when you're entering a difficult um, grief conversation or you're experiencing grief I agree with that something soft all right I got the purple play-doh for myself excellent Okay. Yes. And speaking of something soft, I also recommend that you have something soft with you or like that you can wrap yourself in like a blanket or something weighted that can provide some deep pressure. And that can be like a book on your lap, or I have this mini weighted blanket, um, or wrapping yourself in a regular blanket can also provide that. All right. I'll go get Duchess. <laughs> yes. 
Um, except she's sleeping now, so I will just get the blanket next to me. Okay. Well, but but she can be on standby when she wakes yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. That's the great thing with lap dogs. <laughs> uh, and I really like that that you adjusted um, your plan because you were like, oh, Duchess would be perfect on my lap, but she's busy taking a nap right now. So exactly. We got to think about her needs as well. Although okay. she likes to be on my lap. So <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. I'm all ready. <laughs> Excellent. You look ready. Um, our last plan piece is to plan what we're going to do after the conversation, something that's soothing or nourishing or playful for your body. So we are planning at the end of our conversation for a care tip, um, which will be a belly breathing exercise. Um, but if that doesn't feel like enough for myself, uh, perhaps I will actually go pet Duchess and connect with her and um, maybe play a little if she feels like it. Awesome. That sounds great. I think I'm going to eat breakfast because I haven't eaten yet today. And then I will sit with Muggins and do some light reading. That sounds lovely. <laughs> cool. All right. So we have our care plan in place and now we're ready to start. Great. I feel really ready. Um, I was a little nervous about this conversation. Uh, and actually, I'm I'm happy that we have a plan because it has helped ground me already. Mm -hmm. Um and the reason I'm nervous about this conversation is because one, grief is a very difficult thing to talk about because it could bring up a lot of emotions in ourselves, our audience, and perhaps with Sharon as well. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also uh, a delicate subject that there are a lot of um, uh, misunderstandings about it. And I want to make sure I get it right. But that's also my little perfectionist popping up so I will mm -hmm. hush that side of myself <laughs> as we go into this mm -hmm. um so I think I want to start by saying grief happens to everyone it's something that we all experience um and a lot of times when we say grief we think about a death mm -hmm. um but grief can be so much more than that and you can experience grief in a much broader sense of the word loss or the experience of loss. Mm -hmm. um, and I would even say as we live our lives and life goes on, we experience varying stages of grief through each cycle of our life that we go through. Mm -hmm. So examples of loss um, can be the loss of a pet which is also has to do with death. Yeah. Um, but maybe not just through death. It could be a rehoming of a pet. Yeah. Um, or after a foster dog gets adopted. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and that will bring me to another point, which sometimes grief can occur when uh, even things that are seemingly happy happen, or there may be mixed feelings around, you can still experience grief, with a, which I think is important to say, because a lot of times we only associate it with negative life events. Yeah. Um, so since I started talking about that, another example of that particularly, which recently happened to me is becoming a mother or a parent. Mm. In my experience, it's a mother, um, which again, a lot of times we think about you're having a baby. This is a blessing. It's a beautiful part of life. And it is, but at the same time, I experienced the loss of a self and the complete overwhelming experience of a of a new identity um and something that i continue to grieve mm -hmm. so can other I, example can I, oh, um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. speak to that yeah cuz that's um that's a big nugget that you just shared and i i don't want to move on from that until i fully acknowledge um yeah, I never, never thought about the grief that might be involved with um, becoming a parent. And I totally see how, like you were talking about cycles of life and like you went through this cycle of being a young woman, um, a maiden in a way, if you like that terminology. 
And in having your child, you are no longer in that stage of life and you're never going to be a woman without a child ever again. Exactly. And that is like, it's really a marker for a life I once had and the life I had now. And I think that's a good way of also talking about the experience of grief. So when there are these big, significant life markers that happen. Um, So, you know, the loss of a job is an example, the loss of a relationship, even talking about being a maiden, (laughs) getting into a serious, committed relationship. I have had conversations with friends who said they really had a hard time with that. They wanted it, of course, because they wouldn't do it otherwise. But there was an experience of grief of the single self, the self that can be really, for lack of better words, selfish. And everything is about how you feel and you get to do what you want to do, um, which is also part of the parenthood grief <laughs> because everything is suddenly about this baby. And, and you know, I distinctly remember it at the beginning of motherhood, I was just like, my needs don't matter. They really just don't really matter anymore. Um, And that's a huge uh, experience to be coming from being, you know, a person without a child where you do think mainly about your own needs. Wow. Yeah, there's such a, a freedom of choice and autonomy when you are just worrying about yourself and it is such a loss to like no longer have that ease or that certainty of like this I'm going to do what's best for me and that feels right you know because now not only can you no longer live that way but you also have to learn how to balance um, prioritizing the other's needs with um, prioritizing your own and that's really that's like a new life that you have absolutely absolutely and you know I even think about going off to college for example like that is also something that everybody in that situation ends up grieving um the parents the child that goes um I mean I think there is I think part of in this conversation about grief is that there's complicated emotions when anything happens and I think as at least I'll speak for Western culture, because, you know, I'm American, but that in American culture, it's very common to make things black and white. So you're having a baby. Congratulations. You're getting married. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, your grandfather died. I'm so sorry. And Mm -hmm. there's no room, it feels like, to have these more nuanced conversations Mm -hmm. about complicated feelings so even if we think about grandpa who died um you may have complicated feelings about that you may be feeling relieved Mm -hmm. maybe you didn't have a good relationship with grandpa and there's a potential that there could be some positive feelings associated with it I mean it's even uncomfortable saying that like I feel a little Mm. because it's it's difficult to admit those things right yeah it's like taboo you know yeah. you're supposed like quote supposed to unquote feel a certain way but you're right it's not there's never just one feeling about anything and there's no prescribed or proper way to feel after a loss exactly and speaking about that um I would love to go into talking about uh Kubler Ross, um, because she is the was she a psychiatrist or psychologist? I think she was a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, working with um, she had initially developed her theory working with people who had been diagnosed with terminal illness, not working with people who had experienced um the death of a loved one. Right. So she um wanted to which this is very natural in the in the sciences but also human humans like to uh prescribe patterns to things so that we can understand it better so she came up with a model 
that now is really widespread, uh, widespreadly, I guess I would say accepted, Mm -hmm. um, or thought of as, you know, quote unquote, correct, which we'll talk about after how it may not be, but she came out with a model called the five stages of grief, which include anger, Mm -hmm. denial, um, uh, ber- oh, not bereavement. What am I saying? Yeah, bargaining. Bar- yeah, bargaining. bargaining. Acceptance, and we're missing one. Depression. Depression. Yeah. So it, she came up with this as a very much a linear model, and I think in later in more modern times we have really thought uh, the mo- the mental health field is really considered that this isn't like a linear thing that we go through, and that it is emotions that we ebb and flow uh through when we're experiencing grief um and to add to that before we sort of do some myth busting uh I also wanted to say that the um DSM the diagnostic statistical manual up until the most recent version which we're on number five and we're on iPhone 13 let's just think about that for a second (laughs) (laughs) And the iPhone's only been around 20 years, the DSM almost a hundred. (laughs) So, um, but, um, the DSM for a long time had complicated bereavement as a diagnosis, which meant that if you were feeling grief after a loss after six months, Mm -hmm. and so it was a very specific time period and it's still affecting your functioning, then it became a a type of depression. Oh. Hmm. So that's what it was then. And uh, into the DSM-5, they actually took it out and they put it under, which I think is a good thing, they put it under diagnoses to consider instead of um, an official diagnosis. Oh, interesting. So there, it sounds like they're recognizing that it's not pathological to grieve a loss beyond six months. Exactly. More of a normal and, experience. <laughs> well, and I want to say too, that the reason I said this right after talking about Kubler-Ross is that, you know, it's the same idea. Like you don't just go from steps one, two, three, five. Okay. We're at acceptance. We're done. Otherwise we have a mental health disorder. Right. <laughs> Um, grief does not work like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and furthermore, um, Sharon found a great article about Kubler-Ross, uh, also just, um, challenging the fact that we use this model on people who feel, or, or people who have, um, experienced the death of a loved one when it actually was really studied on people who were, diagnosed with terminal illness and the the experience of grief that they were going through before dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the article I found was by Ada McVean, who is a science writer at McGill University. And I really liked um, this article because she was talking about um, just like the scientific process and how like this is not the way that um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did her research was phenomenological. She interviewed people to understand their experience. And so it wasn't a study where there were like controls and an experimental experimental group. Um, we can't, um, there weren't enough people to say like, this is generalizable to the greater population. Um, and like you said, it's like, it's important to recognize the people that Kubler-Ross was talking to Um, have very different experiences than people who have lost a loved one or experienced a different type of loss. Um, But what I also liked about what Ada uh, McVean was talking about was that the reason why people search for or identify with or um, try to like understand the framework of the Kubler-Ross stages of grief is because I think after a loss or during a loss, there's such... Um, chaos in a way, or like it feels chaotic. It feels very much like 
disorienting. Like I don't know myself anymore. I don't know how to be in the world anymore. And so we're searching for some sort of understanding about this and trying to make meaning out of it and and feel normal, feel like we're not different from everybody else. Yeah, I mean, I think what that brings up for me, what you're saying also is that what a loss does to us is that it really, it kind of bursts the bubble of denial that we have to live in, in order to live. And what I mean by denial, and that's maybe not the best word, but it's the denial or the compartmentalizing of our mortality. And when we experience a loss or a huge life transition, we come very close to mortality and we start, our existential fears start stirring up um, and we feel out of control and we want to make sense of what's going on because it's really scary to be so human and that life is hanging by a thread in some ways. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because we feel we're like very present with our own vulnerability. Yes. You know, I think that's thing, the yeah. same. I think it, there's something similar about um, that's making me think of like when a dog bites a human, like the reason why we judge that behavior as so vile um, is because it reminds us of our own mortality. That makes a lot of sense. I had never thought about that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so that, that's a very scary experience. I think it can be a very isolating experience also, um, which is yeah. the irony with the experience of grief is that we all experience it, but when we do, we often feel very alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and for example, like someone may die in a family and every single family member grieves differently. And it's almost like, their islands in the experience and that can be really hard mm -hmm. um but yeah. at the same time I actually think that one of the most uh beneficial ways of dealing with grief is to be with people who are experiencing a similar grief yeah. so it, you know if you're 25 and your parent died of cancer and you go to a group with other you know 20 somethings with a parent that died of cancer I think that can be very helpful and not feeling so alone mm -hmm. and so separated from the rest of the world mm. yeah it's almost like um the loneliness component of grief is like very it's very intense you know, because the law, I feel like the loss itself is making you feel lonely because you're all of a sudden disconnected from someone that you love or, um, or some components of life that you love. And so if you can connect with other people who are also experiencing that, then you can feel a lot more supported and grounded. Yeah, exactly. I, and I think, you know, it's also interesting to look at the different stages that someone may be in, mm -hmm. um, in terms of how long ago, because time, whether we like it or not, I, and I sometimes find this so cliche, but it's true time heals. Right. So as if we go further along, um, in someone's, uh, grief process, then they might not relate to someone who, for example, just lost some mm -hmm. their parents so mm -hmm. so that's also something to take in, into consideration when like connecting with people um mm -hmm. in your grief yeah yeah I think also it's um it depends upon like your own ability to be present with discomfort you know like if I have grief and today I'm feeling like a lot of acceptance about it um and also on the same day, my friend uh, tells me that her dog passed away. Um, if I'm not comfortable with the discomfort of my friend's shock or uh, anger about the situation, then I'm not going to be able to be present with my friend. And that might be because 
maybe I haven't really allowed myself to feel the anger that I do have in me for my grief. Or maybe I haven't tried to find support so that I can um, process or work through more more of the difficult um, like depression or bargaining stages that happens. Well, and I think ultimately, like any trauma, really, I mean, a loss is a trauma. So Mm -hmm. I think we can make those words interchangeable as well. I think ultimately what how we move on is integrating what occurred into our new life. Mm. Um, And I know for people who experience the death of a pet or a person, they may eventually be able to integrate um, that person into their life, even though they're not alive Mm -hmm. still. Yeah. And I think that that's like a really that that's where we get to the acceptance of the grief is when we can put all these things together and learn how to be in this new life mm. with the loss of um with the loss i guess and and everybody's process is different so mm-hmm. um i can think about many people for example still talk to the law the person who died they'll still have a relationship with them and just because they're not physically there anymore they can still continue that relationship and that might be for some people it might not be for others but Mm -hmm. that's an example of how to integrate um this experience into your new life yeah yeah I can think of of a specific example from my own life Um, One of the losses I experienced as a kid was the loss of my family dog, Toby. And this was a very complex loss because Toby was uh, euthanized for behavioral reasons when he was two years old. And sometimes I even have, like, I don't even like the word euthanized for that situation. It doesn't quite uh, capture what happened because Toby wasn't suffering. He was healthy Um, he had behavioral issues and had bitten people, um, but he wasn't suffering in his life. You know, like we could care for him and, um, we had a, we had a great relationship in our, within our family with him. So, um, yeah, but that loss was very traumatic for my family and, um, really it was like one of the first losses that I experienced as a human And it was so nonsensical, you know, like it didn't make sense to me. Like, why couldn't we find a way to help Toby, you know, learn how to get along with people? Why couldn't we put a fence up around our house, you know, to keep him away from other people? Or, you know, I just had all these questions, like, why was this the only way? And, um, you know, like 30 years later, here I am (laughs) dedicating my life to, um, behavior support, supporting people whose dogs have behavioral issues, um, and not just in a way of like um, helping the dog, but also helping the family and the humans to process what's happening and to understand how they feel about it and to move through um, that process, either like with their dog um, or after their dog has passed away. I'm also offering services to support people through grief um, due to loss of a dog. So I feel like that's my way of integrating the loss of Toby um, into my life, living and working in a way that, um, I don't know, helps me to be the person I wish I had when I was a kid. Wow. So first of all, I wanted to just say that that's a very powerful story um, that was very hard to listen to, actually. That's a very difficult experience. Um, my heart like kind of sank a bit to hear that that happened to you. And it's, Mm. it obviously was very significant in your life. Um, and I think it's a really great example of how you can positively integrate an experience like that 30 years later. Um, and, you know, it reminds me, I think a lot of people, the way that they deal with, with grief, especially these types of, you hear a lot with people who lose children, um, 
or have the death of a child, they end up doing foundations to some type of foundation to help um, other children who may have experienced the same thing as their child. So it just, that popped up for me. Mm. Um, that That's like a really great way of integrating the trauma, a positive way. Um, and that you're still grieving Toby today because you're still doing his work on behalf of him in a sense um so I think that's that's really neat thanks for saying that I got a little uh teary-eyed when you said that because I think my body felt like really seen and affirmed yeah I mean that's I can't like I just can't imagine being not understanding what's going on and being a a, a kid and having your dog taken away from you basically Mm -hmm. that's very painful um you know on that note I also want to bring up that I think the loss of dogs and pets in general is something that um non-pet people uh don't always take seriously Mm -hmm. um and maybe perhaps that's why you felt seen by that because a lot of times I don't think people really know how to affirm someone in their grief um and of the loss of a pet because there's a lack of understanding of that pet really being and I'll say dog because we are a happy <laughs> happy dog happy human podcast um I'll, uh that the losing a dog is so it's they're really your family member and losing them you lose a sense of your routine which you can speak more about if you would like Sharon um it's just it's a pre and post what we were talking about before it's a life it's a life marker and one of the hardest things with having a dog or living with a dog is that you know the likelihood of them dying before you die is quite high um which puts us in an interesting position of grief because we may have anticipatory grief around losing a dog um which I know I experienced with princess my childhood dog very intensely And it almost robbed me in a sense of being able to enjoy being with her because I started feeling anxiety, mostly just anxiety, or I would imagine the scenario of her dying and try to figure out how I would feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Try to prepare for it. So I would like think about all these different scenarios and she also lived to be 14 and a half so I started to have these feelings when she was maybe around 10 so I experienced this anxiety for four and a half years Um, and that's something that with Duchess I want to be really cautious about not doing that Um, sometimes because she's going to be eight this year it's already starting to be on my mind a little um and so I want to approach it differently now that I have the experience and the knowledge of uh, the anxiety that I had about princess dying. Mm, yeah. You don't want to be so anxious or so wrapped up in trying to prepare that you can't be present with Duchess now and enjoy her, the love you have with her now. And I hear a lot of times when I talk to other dog parents, it, it's almost like it's an interesting balance because sometimes they say, I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. It's so scary to think about. It's it's so scary. So they push it away. So I think there's somewhere in the middle where, you know, it is a reality and Mm -hmm. maybe we do need to have some, a little bit of a grief process before, like when someone's terminally ill, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, maybe that's that's part of our grief process because we know it's going to happen so we can prepare a little bit for it but we don't want to take it overboard to the point where we're anxious about it and I think the thing that I learned was that nothing could have prepared me for that moment and no amount of anxiety (laughs) helped me be ready for it and I was actually the one to um call the vet and have the vet come and um 
I watched her die, um, mm-hmm. which just, you know, gives me shivers thinking about it. I just got um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very, it's a very intense thing to go through. Yeah. Um, but it was strange because there was a sense of relief mm-hmm. when I saw her last breath and I felt it before the doctor even said she was gone because I had her face in mine. Oh, and yeah. first I'm like getting teary eyed. Um, but for some reason there was this sense of like, she's at peace now. Yeah. Like she's not in pain anymore. Yeah. And so I felt like strangely with all this, the pure sadness of losing a pet, like there's no, I said that too, like right afterwards, that feeling is so pure and so not contaminated with, you know, whatever complex feelings you might have around, let's say the death of a parent, like you're going to have a lot more complicated feelings around that, even Mm -hmm. if you have a good relationship, but there's just this purity of the sadness that you feel when you lose your dog. Mm. Um, I'm so glad you uh, said it that way because you're right. Like the, the relationship with a dog is, they are a family member. They might be a friend. They might be a a work partner um, depending on your profession. And, um, and not just that, like dogs, are so involved in the things that we do every day that hold up our daily routine um, in terms of like the way we exercise or um, planning meals or um, who we spend time with socially, um, how we take a vacation, you know, like when we're living with a dog, we're doing and and thinking about all of these things in, in caring for them and spending time with them. And, and we, I think, develop a sense of self based on what we do every day. And so that loss of a pet um, is so significant. Um, It feels as though you are falling apart because your uh, sense of self is falling apart. You know, your daily routine is falling apart. And And it can even be like a loss of an identity too, because if you don't have other pets um, or you may feel a loss of identity, like I, oh, I'm no, I'm no longer this anymore. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I'm no longer a dog person. I'm no longer a dog owner. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that can be very intense Mm -hmm. feeling as well. Um, Yeah. And I really appreciate that, that purity of that moment of saying um, goodbye to them. I think it's hard to have that moment though. I don't think everyone has it, you know, like I think the purity of the love between a human and a dog when they're alive um, can be found in lots of different ways. But at that moment of transition, I think because the the ways in which we come to the decision to euthanize, um, or if we don't have the opportunity to make that decision, or if it feels like there's a lot of pressure to make that decision, um, it can be really hard to feel that peace. Well, and I think that that's one of the unique experiences too that we have because we have the responsibility potentially of being the person to make the decision Mm. which I remember was just super anxiety provoking. And so much of the feeling that I had that morning was, am I going to regret this? Mm. Yeah. Because I was making the decision. Is this, is this going to be, am I going to regret this? Yeah. Um, is it the right time? Is it the right time? But I, multiple people had told me at the time, I don't know if maybe this will help someone that usually what people regret is waiting too long. Mm. And so I just kept repeating that to myself as a mantra to deal with it. And those people were right for me. Um, I'm sure for some people, that's not the experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, And maybe you do feel like, oh, maybe I should have just given them another day. You know, that's a very difficult thing to deal with as well. Um, Yeah. But I also, I appreciate what you're saying. I might veer a little bit away from talking about the loss of a dog, because I think part of maybe what we, why we don't have this potential I think could be healing experience being there in that moment with them is because uh, a lot of Western culture 
we are very squeamish about death. We don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. We want to put it away somewhere. We want to put it in a hospital. We want to put it at the vet's office. I mean, a lot of times people have the option to take their pet and to walk away and let the vet do it. Um, more and more, we, we don't want to look at death. We don't want to be around it. We're very afraid, squeamish, don't want to get close to that mortality. Mm. Um, in denial. <laughs> right, exactly. And I think we even, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this as well. I'm going to preface that, that we memorialize people by um, celebrating their life in Western culture a lot of the time, which is a good thing. And we should do that. But we leave little room to experience communal grief together in that way. Yeah. And I know, for example, in the Afghan culture, maybe other Middle Eastern cultures, but in the Afghan culture specifically, they go to the mosque the day after the person has died and they are not allowed to talk and they cry and they wail. And that is how you move through the grief communally mm -hmm. before you go into the memorializing someone's life. And I think that can be very powerful and be very healing. Mm -hmm. Um all by extremely painful, but that's sort of where we're at as a culture is we don't want to feel pain. I mean, Americans, especially my, my husband is Dutch and he laughs all the time because I'm constantly, you know, taking pills or I have a solution for any little pain we might have. Mm -hmm. Like, here's a, here's a pill. Here's a patch. <laughs> yeah, Just fix it. <laughs> fix it. Yeah. We don't want to feel suffering, um, in American culture specifically. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that that has seeped into how we grieve and how we um, deal with death as a whole. Yeah, yeah, you're um, making me think of the author that you told me about, Caitlin Dowdy, who um, is an author and a speaker and a mortician. And um, I was listening to her TED Talk last week and she was talking about how in um, American culture, we... Uh, we like dress up the body when after someone has died to make it look like they're just peacefully resting, but they're still alive. You know, like we try to paint over the messiness of death and not acknowledge that it is messy. Um, and and it and in doing that, it's like again, it's denial of our own mortality, but also a a denial that we are also of the earth. You know, that same separation of like, oh, a dog can bite a human. Like, yes, we are also of the earth. We are also animals. But when we are burying people like in a cemetery, there are these um, bar barriers between us and the earth, you know, like mm. the coffin and the like coffins are laid into a metal vault. So like they're not laid directly onto the earth and so we're all we're like not allowing ourselves to decompose and fall apart and go home to the earth and be recycled because we're all made of the same stuff yeah. I mean I it's I think about many many people say I just can't imagine you know so and so's body being eaten by worms mm. but also isn't that the beauty of being human is to eventually be eaten by the worms. Um, yeah. I think that reminded me of a documentary I saw once um, uh, about burial practices, I think. And in the Himalayas, there is no ground. It's rock in the very tall part. So they can't bury. It's rock and ice. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they lay the body out of the deceased and the uh, birds eat the body. And that's a way of recycling. And so we don't, Americans specifically, we just, we do not want anything to do with it. And I even think about the other funny thing. It's the same thing with my Dutch husband who laughs at it, that we call pig meat pork and <laughs> uh, cow meat. What do we call cow meat? I guess Burgers. just meat. <laughs> Burgers. <laughs> so in Dutch, you just it's called pig, it's called cow, yeah. it's called chicken. Like we don't that's another thing. This is a dead animal we're eating and we don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah, we just pretend it's something else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So 
it's a little bit more of a silly example, but I think, and even myself, you know, this conversation is difficult. It's difficult to say the words dying. You know, we keep saying passing away sometimes or the loss because yeah, we're just, I think we're not used to it. Um, and recently I've even been thinking about, you know, how to talk about these things with my daughter when I'm not even comfortable talking about it too much with you, for example, and she's going to have those questions and how, how do you, you know, so many times we say, oh, grandpa went to the sky, but like, is that an appropriate way to be talking to our children? Mm. Um, or should we be more upfront with them about mm -hmm. death? Wow. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, those are big questions. And I think, um, I think about dogs a lot in death and grief situations for youngsters, because um, the death of a family dog is often the first loss that a human child will experience. And when there is another type of loss, like the loss of a human family member, if there's a dog in the family, the dog is often able to be the most present with the children while the adults are experiencing this loss because the dog isn't like trying to fake or mask anything and, um, and won't leave you when you're crying. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, an amazing thing. Another reason to live with a dog, especially for kids, it can help their development so much, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> mm, yeah. But I think, you know, I think all in all, this is, I'm glad we had this conversation in this way. It, it's messy. Grief is messy. Grief yeah. can be experienced in so many different ways. Yeah. So many different events can trigger it. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like it's just an ongoing experience that we have in life that we are going to go in and out of because ultimately we're also grieving our own lives mm -hmm. throughout our life yeah. um, in the bigger sense of the word that we're all going to die. Right. And yeah and so that's that's as we age that's also part of what's going on for us mm -hmm. yeah and I think when we can like find ways to sit with the, the mess and the discomfort um for short periods of time you know and find ways to care for ourselves as we move through that I think we open up something in ourselves to be able to also more fully embrace things like joy and celebration and love. I completely agree with that. And it's, it's sort of what we were saying with my experience with princess, like mm -hmm. my anxiety of wanting to prepare or not think about her death led me astray from feeling joy when I was with her. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately it's coming to a place of acceptance, which I think Kubler Ross got that one, right. <laughs> that that is, that is a state that I, I think is the desired state um, at the end of the day when we experience grief to be in a place of integration, acceptance, wholeness, um, and so on. Yeah. And if you can, when you can find that, um, just acknowledge it. And if you can't find it or you haven't yet, you're not doing it wrong. You know, you just do the best you can, you know, that's all we can do is just try our best. Absolutely. And once we have quote unquote found it, you also may get out of it and then you'll find it again. And that's part of this messy process yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So I think life lesson, um, don't be afraid to get in the mess. Yes, I love it. <laughs> so um, I guess we can transition into our post-care tip. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it feels like a really good spot to end. I think so. I have to say the Play-Doh was fabulous and I'm going to be using that more often. Mm -hmm. um, nice. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed um, sipping my warm tea. Great. Me too. <laughs> um, okay. So for our post-care tip, we're going to do uh, a breathing exercise uh, that I generally like to do laying down um, because I feel like I can feel my body better. But since we're sitting here, we're going to sit, but I definitely recommend laying down. 
Um, and we're going to put one hand over your heart and lungs and the other hand on your belly. Mm -hmm. And we're going to close our eyes. Okay. And we're going to take a breath in and fill our bellies as much as we can. Breathe in, 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 in. And now we're going to feel our stomach deflate as we exhale. And now we're going to do the same, but we're going to breathe into our lungs and feel our lungs expand. Breathe in. And as we exhale, we're going to exhale through the belly. And our belly might expand a little bit as we do that. And then now we're going to breathe in through the belly again. Feel it expand, expand, expand. And as you breathe out, feel your lungs and belly even out again. And one last time, we're going to now breathe into both lungs and belly. We're expanding our whole torso is expanding. And now we're going to breathe out as everything evens back out to our natural stance. And we're gonna open our eyes in three, two, one. Ooh. I was imagining myself like a, uh, you know, those bellows, those like old fashioned bellows that people would use to like blow on a fire. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, a good I, think myself like that. <laughs> I just think of myself as a balloon usually when I do it but yeah um yeah that it's a I really like to do this exercise usually after doing some yoga so mm -hmm. if anybody is a yogi out there when you're laying down in shavasana it's a good good way to uh practice mindfulness and rest mm -hmm. yeah I just liked um just getting to just focus on one thing, you know, like what's my belly doing right now? Or how's that air going into my body? Yeah. Yeah. I always, that's always the most helpful to me to just get your mind on one thing mm -hmm. gets you present. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. And uh, thanks for a lovely conversation. And um, next time we will be talking about uh, grief in dogs, the experience of dogs. Um, experiencing grief. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Can't wait. Even though we are licensed professionals in our own field of work, Angela, LCSW, Sharon, OTD, and CDBC, this podcast is not intended to replace individual therapy for humans or behavior support for dogs. We approach our conversations from an exploratory, observational, and strictly personal lens. If you are struggling with your mental health, your dog's behavior, or if you or your dog have experienced a recent traumatic event, please see the resources section on our websites for a list of resources and places that can help. Visit either www.hc-collab.com slash happy dog, happy human, or www.clouddoodles.com slash happy dog, happy human. For additional show notes, including books and articles that we mentioned, please check out the footnotes section on our websites. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support the show, go to buymeacoffee.com slash podcast and send us a few bucks so that we can stay awake and energized to make more content. This podcast is made possible by the collaboration between Cloud Doodles and Human Canine Collaborative. Check out our websites at www.clouddoodles.com or www.hc-collab.com. Special thanks to Tom Fox at Tom Fox Photos 
for support with editing and production consulting. You can find Tom at TomFoxPhotos.com. Also, special, special thanks to sound effects and story examples from Duchess and Muggins. We could not and would not ever want to do this without you.